I'd like to call the Anacorta City Council meeting of September 26, 2022 to order. Mr. Franciak, would you take the roll, please? Mr. Carter. Present. Mr. Young. Mr. Walters. Here. Ms. Cleland McGrath. Here. Ms. Moulton. Uh, yeah, we can see her, but uh, I can't hear her. Can you not hear me now? No, got it. Got you now. Oh, sorry, here. <laughs> Mr. McDougall. Here. Ms. Hubick. Here. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Miller. Oh. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Carter and then Ms. Moulton. I'd like to excuse Mr. Young from tonight's meeting. Second. All right, a motion by Mr. Carter, a second by Mr. McDougall. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Ms. Moulton? Uh, that was what I was going oh, to. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. All right, would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? All right, uh, it's always nice to see uh, folks coming into City Hall. And uh, we'll start with announcements and committee reports. Uh, first announcement, uh, a little trestle update. Um, the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms uh, report is out for technical review, so we're still waiting for the uh, final report from the ATF. So hopefully we'll hear by the end of this week on the investigation. Uh, the city staff has been meeting with contractors uh, last week and I signed a contract with our engineers to prepare engineering draw drawings so permits can be submitted to the federal, state, and local agencies. Hopefully we'll have all the permits by early October. Again, the work on the site can't begin until the necessary permits and uh, structural engineering uh, drawings are approved, but we are, will continue to expedite these efforts. Uh, final piece is to make sure we have the supplies we need to rebuild the trestle and our initial inquiries showed about uh, some of the materials could be out to three months. So we're looking for any creative ways to see if we can't move that up quickly. And also again, please keep extra vigilant uh, for additional bike traffic on Highway 20 as they have to navigate around the uh, damaged trestle. Uh, Oyster Run, I'd uh, just like to thank uh, especially uh, Anacortes uh, Police Department, Anacortes Fire Department for their extra efforts in making sure everybody was safe at Oyster Run. Uh, great weather and it turned out to be a great event uh, with uh, not uh, a whole lot of uh, trouble. A lot of motorcycles, and, uh, but uh, everything worked out great. So thanks to our public safety departments. All right, over to Council Announcements and Committee Reports, Housing Affordability Community Services Committee. Mayor Miller. Ms. Moulton. Thank you. So we had an excellent meeting last Thursday, September 22nd, with um, staff from Helping Hands, who is a, is a food provider countywide. Karen Flint is their engagement coordinator. She spoke with us and gave a presentation. Part of it included the fact that September is Hunger Action Month, and in Washington State, 11.5% of people identify as food insecure. And there's a whole spectrum of what that means, um, but pretty significant. And in Skagit County, that's 14,000 people. Um, so Helping Hands provides food to places around the county. They were at the church, um, maybe still are, across from Whitney School once a week, but they have opened a facility on Swinomish property and one in Burlington and they are opening an Anaporta Solution Center um, at 3018 Commercial next to Windermere. Um, so they were telling us a little bit about their programs and we had quite a few questions about their processes and how they will partner with other organizations in our community to avoid duplication of efforts and to best serve our people in need. So we, they have contacted people on T Avenue, which we hadn't known prior to that meeting, and been providing food and hygiene um, 
products to them and also cell phones. And they have also been providing garbage pickup on Tuesday. So it was good we had this meeting so we could learn these things. And we encourage them to keep in contact with us and Chief Floyd, the HACS committee and other service providers. So those conversations will be ongoing so um, we can all do this work together as a team. And that was pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, 3B Planning Committee. Mayor Miller. Mr. Walters. The Planning Committee met just before this meeting. Um, it had also met earlier uh, last week to discuss directly with uh, makers, our consultant on our housing action plan, some of the um, features of that plan. I think uh, Christine Cleveland McGrath recounted some of that last week. And so we talked a little bit more about that this week. Um, basically, to sum up, we're not meeting our housing goals set in our 2016 conference of plan for production of numbers of units. And in order to achieve those goals, we need to look at additional measures to enable more housing here in Anacortes. Um, and then of course, in just a couple of years, we're going to have to update our conference of plan and we're gonna get a new set of metrics to try to achieve. Um, so time is of the essence to figure out how to achieve these things before we get those new uh, targets. So we reviewed makers recommendations for how that might occur and provided our feedback to the planning department. And all of that will be coming forward to uh, both the city council, but then ultimately the planning commission in the near future. I also wanted to note um, for council that I've been appointed to the Association of Washington City's uh, working group on housing solutions. We're meeting fairly frequently to discuss what kind of statewide legislative solutions cities could support in the next legislative session. I've participated in these statewide stakeholder meetings before. And so very similarly, uh, like others, we're advocating for flexibility, not a one size fits all approach, not a set of mandates for cities and for condominium liability reform and maybe a few other innovative approaches that I'll be able to discuss in the next coming weeks. But I wanted to give council a heads up to that because if you'd like to provide input to me to inject into that process, uh, please reach out. And then finally, I appreciate council for excusing my absence in the last couple of meetings. I had a great time in Europe and I came back and got COVID. So FYI, it's still out there and uh, please everyone be careful. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Fiber Committee, Mr. Mayor McDougall. Uh, Fiber Committee met on last Thursday, and another good report. Um, going with the numbers here, we are at 15, as of Thursday, we were at uh, 1,580 total customers on the network. Um, and so, you know, adding about three to four a day, we'll be crossing the 1,600 customer threshold here in the next week or two. Um, it's a mix of, it's actually a, a strong mix of gigabit service, uh, stronger than initial models projected. We projected kind of a 75%, 100 meg, 25% gig split. And it's actually more like 65, 35. So our average revenue per customer, um, it's kind of ARPU is the acronym, is higher than projected. So that's very terrific. A um, couple of other things here. So. We, the, the department applied for a uh, Washington State Broadband Office 25% matching grant on the EDA grant. And as of now, there was an initial uh, WSBO staff recommended approval and, uh, but there's I think kind of one more bit of discussion there. But that'll be really nice to have that come through. Um, Guimas expansion, the uh, <clears throat> initial construction contract is signed and ready to go. We expect initial work to begin kind of in early October. And then another couple final notes. Uh, our, our network administrator accepted an IT director position elsewhere. So we uh, have an opening, I think, or at least the opening was posted last week, maybe closed already. Um, I assume we probably got some candidates in the pool. And then finally, um, We've signed a dark fiber lease with uh, Astound Broadband, which is formerly Wave. Uh, so dark fiber lease out to, I, I believe, out to like toward the water treatment plant through the uh, the water pipe. So that's a nice little extra chunk of revenue as well. Anything else? Okay. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, library committee report. Yeah, Mayor Miller. 
Ah, Ms. Cleland. Thank you. So we had a library committee meeting uh, last Thursday. Um, we had uh, Philip Steffen from uh, the finance department come and kind of go do a preliminary discussion about the library's budget for next year and it went smoothly. We're going to probably hear about it more later in the, um, the open gov overview. Um, the, the library is working on the children's library update, which has been going smoothly there. Thanks to Sylvia and Bobby Maxson, they've done a, generously donated the funds to do that update. Um, the library is, has been working on getting just the right uh, things for the for the children's uh, area, and so now we are waiting for supply chain issues. So early 2023, um, summer reading was a huge success. There were about 33 summer reading programs for children with an attendance over 1,500. Um, that all, there was also um, outreach for schools and YMCA groups. There were 600 people registered for summer reading program. Um, so that went really well. In October, which I wasn't aware of, um, we are a family place library play and learn series. So that it's the first time we've done it since the pandemic. And it's an opportunity for um, toddlers and their parents or caregivers to come um, and do a series of play-based classes. And then there's also community professionals there to answer questions regarding early literacy, speech and language, child development and nutrition. Um, so this actually filled up in a week, but there will be another session in the spring. So look for that. Um, the teen events are going well. We've, they've decided that they're gonna try to emphasize or do a focus for both for high school and middle school separately, just because they've got a little bit of a different vibe and and they do better kind of independently of one another. Um, we're, this library is working on renewing the student library card in our local contract with the district. And so that should come forward shortly. And then finally, just as a point of interest on Friday, October 7th, the library will be closed because they are going to be doing a staff training in service day. Um, and then again, they're gonna work with Parks and Rec uh, on the Haunted Walk and the Winter Wonderland um, and continue with adult and children's programming. So thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, council announcements, committee reports? Okay, uh, gonna move on to item four, which is public comment. And I'm guessing that everybody didn't show up here for those awesome committee reports and they wanna address the uh, council. So this is the opportunity for members of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on the agenda. I've got uh, three signed up and I've received written comment from one member of the public. So I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Franciak to go ahead and read the uh, written public comment into the record if you're ready to do so. And then I'll, uh, then I'll uh, recognize the folks who have signed up first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This comment was submitted by Mr. Roger Jewett. He comments, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I would like to add my voice to the speakers expressing concerns about public safety arising from homeless people sleeping on streets, individuals living in RVs and automobiles, panhandlers, drug dealers, and campers on public property. I respectfully suggest the city, one, draft and publicize a policy statement condemning these conditions, two, initiate additional measures to reduce them, and three, report actions that have been taken as a regular agenda item at each council meeting. People in Anacortes see derelict cars on T Avenue, vagrants sleeping on the sidewalk, hear about car prowls and break-ins, and they feel insecure. If you drive around Old Town and neighborhoods from D Avenue and 22nd Street northward, you will see <clears throat> all the new fences being built. These new fences are easy to recognize because of their golden brown color. Homeowners are adding fences because they do not feel safe and want to protect themselves and their property. While the job of attacking these problems has not gotten any easier because of new laws and court decisions, there are ways to deal with them and prevent Anacortes from becoming another Seattle or Portland. It is time for action. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. That again, written comment from uh, Mr. Roger Jewett of Anacortes. Uh, and I think you read it under three minutes, uh, which is what we try to uh, work that to. All right, so first up on the list, I have a Cheryl Decker 
and the topic is private encroachment of city property. Cheryl Decker, did I? Oh, sorry, yeah, come right up to the podium there and then uh, get uh, pretty close to the microphone and then uh, tap, the, tap the little button there and the blue light should come on for you. And then uh, you can adjust it a little bit. And can you hear me? Yeah, that's perfect. And yeah, you just state your name and uh, where you live. You don't have to give your address, though. Anna Cordes is fine. I'm Cheryl Decker, and I live in Lower Capsani, and I'm a botanist for the National Park Service. My office is in Cedro Woolley, but I um, have made Anna Cordes my permanent home and hope to live here forever. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I chose this area is because the abundance of public lands, obviously, as a parky. I love that. Um, and I waited, I rented for a long time before I found this house I live in currently. And part of the reason is the public lands in Cap Sani. I absolutely love them. So as you all know, there's some encroachment issues, um, which I'm very concerned about because of one public access, but also because um, there have been some private plantings of Class C noxious weeds on this property. Um, they're Class C in both the state of Washington and um, Skagit County. While um, Class C weeds are not required for removal, I don't think we should be allowing them to be planted on public lands. Um, the one I'm talking about is pampas grass, and it's a huge problem in California, and I have seen it working its way up the Oregon coast. I think it will soon be in Washington. So we don't need to be um, spreading these around. Um, I'm concerned because uh, many letters have been written about this subject and nothing has happened. And I work for the federal government, I get it. Things happen very slowly. But I'd like to um, suggest maybe putting some uh, timelines on, on getting some of these issues taken care of. And there, there are many, I realize that, but um, we could maybe go one at a time. But doing nothing is always a bad option. Thank you. Uh, next, I have uh, John, I think it's Wilkerson. Yes, thank you. Named John Wilkinson, live up on Cap Sante in Anacortes, and here just to speak in support of the neighborhood petition about uh, restrictions of people's access to the uh, to the parkland in Capsante down on 5th Street. And by way of background, that area is basically a dead end street that has been uh, planted on by one of the neighbors. <coughs> and we too live on a dead end street in Capsante. The neighbors maintain the uh, this median of the street, etc., etc. And it gets a lot of visitors sightseeing. We even get some, unfortunately, get some overnight visitors who sleep in their cars. But aside from that, what we don't do on our dead end street is try and restrict access from anybody in the public. And I think the example being set on Fifth Street of uh, restricted access and effectively privatization of a of a street that should access that parkland is a very poor one and I'd encourage the council there's several ordinances pro prohibiting it but unless there's some enforcement with a deadline then the ordinance has become meaningless and is that just sending a signal to those of us who live on dead end streets that we can do whatever we want to restrict access because that's the message we're getting from fifth street thank you thank you uh, Lori Morgan. Hi. You can Is this light you, on. Yeah, you're you're okay. you're talking, and you can adjust the microphone too. You won't you won't break it. Okay. I'm um I'm Lori Morgan. I live in the Cap Santee neighborhood, and I'm here tonight to express my concern about the encroachment by the homeowners at 115 Fifth Street on the city property that is adjacent to the Cap Santee Park and in fact next to the trailhead accessing that park. For years, the homeowners' pervasive use of this city property as their private driveway duped me into believing that it was in fact their private driveway. 
and I was deterred from using that trailhead as a result. Now this hasn't been going on for this has been going on for a very long time. In fact, over 10 years. The city sent a letter to the homeowners on January 11, 2012, asking the homeowners to remove the encroachment, and that letter has been entirely disregarded. And it's the length of time that this is encroachment has been allowed to persist that concerns me so greatly, and it causes me to wonder how many instances is the city aware of where private individuals have been allowed to encroach on what is the taxpayer's property? And of those instances, how many instances have been allowed to persist for 10 years or more as this has? And if this city is allowing multiple long-standing encroachments on city property, how is that justified to taxpayers and your constituents? On the other hand, if this is a one-off situation, why are these particular homeowners being given special dispensation? This city property that we're talking about here, this is, provides access to one of the best parks Anacortes has to offer. It's a treasure up there, and you can't allow these private individuals to usurp this property for their own private use. It's unlawful, and it is unjust. And I respectfully request that the council take affirmative steps. It's time. End the encroachment. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have anybody else signed up, but is there anybody else that wants to, yeah, that may have come in late and didn't get a chance to sign up? Come on up. My name is John Paul Cox. Um, I live here in Anacortes, but I represent the Campbells tonight. Um, so if there's a little bit of a history here, um, the Packards had this property before my father and um, another gentleman purchased it. The, the Packards actually used this vacant piece of property for access for a long time. And even today, I would say, and in fact, I'd invite anybody down there to go take a look at this access because it's about as good as it's ever been in the last 100 plus years. So the reality is that the, the trailhead is not being uh, in imposed. In fact, I have a picture here, but I can't obviously uh, present it. But I would encourage everybody, if they could, just to drive down there and see if there's any issue accessing the trailhead because there's a nice sign there and it's very easy to access. But another thing I would say is the Campbells are planning to remove the trees. In fact, right now, there's a schedule right now. I emailed uh, Don earlier today that November 30th is kind of a deadline that we're trying to set for ourselves. Um, it'll probably happen a little sooner than that, but um, the trees do need to be dormant, and we're planning on moving them about five, six feet or so um, back because we do have a plan to put a, an access road to um, a little subdivision we're doing there, we're dividing two lots. So. But anyhow, I, do, I would encourage you guys all go take a look at this, the site and tell me if there's any issue whatsoever accessing uh, the trailhead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other public comment before we move on to the rest of the agenda? Okay, uh, moving on to item five, five A and B, the consent agenda, council. Mayor Miller. Mr. Carter. I move that we approve consent agenda Alpha and Bravo. Second. Okay, a motion by Mr. Carter, a second by Ms. Hubick to approve consent agenda items A and B. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, on to item six, which is other business. And uh, this is open gov overview. 2023-2028 Capital Facilities Plan. It's really an open gov overview and uh, we'll use the Capital Facilities Plan as the demonstration or Mr. Hoagland and his team that hopefully the rest of his team will arrive soon. Um, but uh, it's the opportunity. I, I know Council, you, hopefully you've received your logins and uh, you're taking a look at it because we're Working through OpenGov uh, as we're working to get the 2023 budget 
uh, ready. So, Mr. Hoagland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, and members of the audience. Uh, so, we wanted to just do a quick open gov overview tonight. Um, our finance manager, Philip Steffen, is uh, on his way as we speak. He he, he uh, coaches little league soccer, so he's he had practice tonight and is on his way. But I wanted to go through a little bit of the background, how we got here, and then kind of next steps. So. You uh, may remember during the pandemic, the use of online resources became uh, exceedingly important, and um, we, we, we found a real lack in our ability to, to clearly communicate financial data. So during the 2021 budget development, there was actually a lot of discussion around that very thing, how to communicate the financial data better uh, to, um, to the constituents through online data, or through online means. <clears throat> So when the budget was adopted for fiscal year 2021, that was ordinance 3078, budget language, or I'm sorry, language was actually included that directed the finance committee to do a research of uh, online data platforms. So uh, we made a few presentations, uh, went through some, did our due diligence, uh, ended up back here April 26th of this year, 2022. That's when the contract was executed. So we looked at uh, four different programs w before we landed on OpenGov. Um, we talked with and received presentations from Socrata, which is a Tyler program. They're associated with <coughs> Eden. <coughs> Apologies. Uh, associated with Eden, who runs, who um, develops our ERP system. Questica was another program we looked at, Domo and OpenGov. They all had uh, similar price points, but um, a lot of variation in what they offered. OpenGov and Questica were the only two programs that we looked at that actually offered um, a budget development process for the city, as well as the transparency portal. Um, OpenGov provided a number of references. They were all very positive, one of them being uh, just right down the road from us, Mount Vernon, Washington. Uh, I spoke with their finance director, I believe. Uh, Mayor Miller spoke with uh, Mayor Boudreau about, uh, about that. We got very positive feedback from them, and that's already turned out to be a very positive relationship with us. We've met with them directly. They've started their implementation process before us, so we've been able to kind of piggyback on some of the things we've done and uh, shared experiences. So our implementation schedule uh, was pretty aggressive. We signed the contract in late April of this year, but we wanted to use it for the 2023 budget development. So we started that with the capital facilities plan for 2023 through 2028. Um, Council will remember that we do this CFP budget development in conjunction with the operating budget. So we'll end up adopting both budgets at the same time later in the year. Then we'll move on to the 2023 operating budget. The final phase of OpenGov implementation will be the public transparency portal. So we currently we have all employees who are involved with the budget have an OpenGov user ID. Um, now all council members have a OpenGov user ID as well. The, all, of the, all of the CFP data and operating budget data have input using OpenGov. Have uh, the, the staff have used OpenGov to do that input. The feedback we've received from staff using OpenGov has been very positive. Uh, Philip Steffen has been our key point of contact with OpenGov and with staff for the implementation process. So it was a couple weeks ago on Friday the 16th when he emailed council login IDs and a five minute instructional video um, to the council members. If you haven't watched that instructional video, I would encourage you to do that. I've watched it. It's about five and a half minutes long. It's very informative. Uh, I've referred back to it a couple of times, actually. He goes through um, looking at the data as well as developing and saving reports. Um, this is one of the reports that I used just earlier today as I was putting this slide deck together. Uh, I pulled up a report that Philip had put together added one filter to pull up the 2023 projects. So this is just a quick snapshot of the, the 2023 year of the 2023 through 2028 
capital facilities plan. Um, this just shows, it shows the, the top eight, you can see the top eight projects that make up 80% of the spending or the budget in 2023. And then this slice up here, the 11.6 is the, a, the remaining 20% of that. Um, but Philip will go into more detail tonight how to do these reporting and filtering for this data. Uh, I put up here the rest of the, the schedule that we have for the, uh, both the operating budget and the capital facilities plan budget. Uh, next week, October 3rd, is our public hearing on the 2023 revenues. So stat state statute requires that we have a public hearing on revenue sources for the upcoming budget, including any potential property tax levies. Um, also that same night, Public Works will be here to do an in-depth review of the capital facilities plan for Public Works. The following week on October 10th, the mayor's budget message. We'll also do an additional CFP review for governmental budgets, governmental CFP budget that night. October 17th, we'll get into the 2023 operating budget, looking at Public Works departments. The following week on the 24th will be the review of the operating budget for the governmental funds. That brings us to November 7th, public hearing on the budget. That same night, we'll present ordinances for the CFP, the operating budget, and property tax levy. So this does this schedule leaves us a lot of a lot of room. It's it's a little bit aggressive, but I think it's very realistic. Um, even if we go beyond November 7th, there's two meetings after that. You can still slide into the long Thanksgiving weekend with budget accomplished. So that's the background that I've prepared. I really hope that Philip is here by now. I haven't looked behind me. But I'd be happy to entertain any uh, questions that anybody has or uh, any thoughts. Mind. Yeah, and and I think the idea for tonight was kind of this. Kind of will set the stage on how you might might see the the budget presented. Um, you know, those of us who have been on council for a while, and um, you know, we're used to seeing the spreadsheets, and now it'll be a combination of uh, you know the presentation here plus um, you know pulling up Open Gov. Again, the feedback that I'm getting the the finance folks are still getting used to working away from <coughs> Excel, um, but the uh, directors, the staff, and, and people who aren't uh, finance uh, gurus like uh, Mr. Hoagland and his team uh, really like the OpenGov to be able to enter um, you know, more, more data and, and work with it, because I think for council and ultimately for the public's use, having Having good descriptions of uh, what why, what are the changes in the budget, what are the deltas, uh, what what are the what are the reasons behind it, where are we going to get the funding for things like in a CFP? Um, you know, I think you'll you'll find that when you when you mess around with the Open Gov, it'll be a lot easier to to pull that up rather than previously you'd have to hit the little triangle in the Excel spreadsheet to to figure out what uh, what the background is behind that. But, uh, so any questions? All right, <clears throat> well, and if uh, Philip doesn't show up, then uh, Steve is gonna, he's gonna show just how easy OpenGov is to use for somebody who is not the expert, the expert on staff, which is Philip. Has anybody logged into it so far? Uh, I see a few head nods, okay. <clears throat> uh, the, the other area that uh, the staff has been exper experimenting with um, are the, one thing that the um, previous you weren't able to do is um, do priorities. So there's, there's, a, there's a place to put priorities in on uh, 
in OpenGov and what I think based on experience of working through budget from the council perspective and one of the areas where we run into uh, um, pressures on the budget every year is uh, expenditures for REIT and you know, the competing uh, the competing things for REIT so if there were things involving REIT um, it might be helpful if we can discuss priorities so ultimately council can decide what the priorities are uh, as we move forward and rack and stack that way. I think that could be a helpful tool in OpenGov. But uh, Mr. Hoagland couldn't be happier that uh, Philip is here. And uh, with that, you're re ready to go give the demonstration on OpenGov in the CFP. So welcome. All right, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the council, and I guess members of the audience online. Um, so I am excited to start de demonstrating this OpenGov software. And uh, I'm, unfortunately, though, we are not quite ready for a, uh, the, to be public, be live for the public. We are working towards that. Um, but we wanted to make sure that it was working for in-house uh, first, of course, and to be able to satisfy our CFP and budgeting needs and then we'll be working on the transparency portal. Uh, well, we already are, but we're just not fully ready yet. So you should have all received um, an invitation to sign up for your account on OpenGov. And uh, so members of the audience and those who don't have a login, this, is gonna, this isn't what it will look like for you. So I just wanted to make that disclaimer. Um, but those of you who are council who have a login or city staff, this is what you will be seeing. Um, so uh, this is the reports screen. Um, and the CFP reports are the ones that are shared with council. So those are the ones you should see. Uh, you can also change the view on this top right to a more list view. Um, that that works, works well for me. So CFP reports. Um, we'll start here. So we can go, let's go CFP by project. Um, and the way these reports work is that when you click on the report, it goes to the default view that the report creator has made. And so this is the default view for this report. Um, and then from here, you can change the filtering of the data, or you can um, click on the Views tab. And these are different views that the creator of the report has saved. So what this report is, um, the CFP by project, is basically our, our CFP overview. So on the old document, we used to have a page for each department. And it would show that department or um, segment of the CFP's projects. This is all of them in graph view and then down below is in list view. And the scrolls over. I'm not sure why the screen screen looks different than the one I have on my computer, but okay, so if we were to we could go into we'll just go to fiber. It's, First one on the list there. Um, these are the fiber projects by title and then dollar amount by year. From, from the reports, we, have, we basically use those as overviews. So there's, there's not a lot of detail in the reports. They're useful for uh, looking at the totals and depending on which report you're looking at, so we'll go back to reports, um, and we could do like by revenue type. Um, this is an example of uh, what, where the reports are useful as an overview. And one of the things that, that we were looking at was um, within this transfers in project category is the REIT one, for example. Um, so this is how much REIT 1 the projects in the CFP are planning to use. And 
if home sales decline, then we would have to re-evaluate how much REIT we can be spending. This, that's an example of how these reports are useful and, and what we use this information for. If you'd like to see more detail, we would click over on the left where it says budgets. And uh, as a council member, you have access to the CFP budget at this point. So on the top left, you can see which budget we're in. And that's, it says 2023 to 2028 CFP. Um, so the way that we have the CFP built into OpenGov is having what's called a proposal for each project. Each project is a proposal, which is um, compared to the old CFP document, would be one page. From there, we can um, scroll through them. This is all of the projects. And uh, if you were looking for something specific, uh, you can also search in the search box up above. Not sure why that's not working. But um, one of the things I'll share for those um, who are new to this is you can change these columns. In this screen, or pretty much any of the screens that have columns, by clicking on the little down arrow and then the vertical bar lines. This allows you to change which columns you see. So when we're looking at these detail screens, this is a very useful um, tool because there's a lot of information that's available, but you might not need to see all of it depending on what you're looking at. So, you know, a start date or estimated completion date might not be relevant to what you're reviewing. Uh, created by or status is not necessarily uh, relevant for the CFP. And so by doing that, we just eliminated some columns, and then we can see more information. Um, let's look at a, so I'm going to look here. So if you see the 2023 expense column, these are projects that are in, in next year's budget, right? So what we will be doing is taking the capital facilities plan and adopting it, and those dollar amounts will roll into the 2023 annual budget as a combined capital operating budget, the same as we've always done. Um, so let's look at um, like cap sanity improvements. Um, this detail is entered by the project managers or department heads um, and allows you to see additional detail for each project. And from here, you can also look specifically at the expenses or revenues related to it. So we would want to go to revenues if we wanted to see what, 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 is, uh, what revenue source is paying for this project. You can see that on this line here. And if we scroll all the way to the right-hand side, can't quite see it, so let's change our columns. Once you change them on when you're logged in, it'll stay. This is the first time I've logged in on this, um, this device, I guess. Feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. I'm happy to to do that. Oh, I missed, missed 2027. So I've changed all the columns. There's the total. We can click into this, uh, this line, and that'll give us additional detail as to, so it looks like this project is planned to use uh, grants 
contributions or donations. On the right-hand side, we've coded it as grants and contributions as a general category. This general category can be viewed in reports. By funding source. So that would be that category there. So, and like this line here, there's there's some information that uh, we're actually working with OpenGov to to correct that. When there's multiple lines within a proposal, it seems to be capturing it differently here. It's one of the things that we're working through. Um, but I assure you, we will we will utilize the software to the best of our ability and to be, the best what it can do. Yeah. Uh Keep in mind what we're five months into when we sign the contract with OpenGov and we're trying to do our budget on top of this. And so there are some bugs and that's why, you know, I really would like uh, council to, to weigh in if you find stuff and provide some feedback because I don't want to have this open, uh, open yet uh, providing misinformation out there. So, you know, these are a couple of examples of, of things we're working on. But uh, again, ultimately, I think it presents the information well. It allows you to, to dive deep, mainly for me, finding the detailed explanation of what, what, the, what it is. You know, a ladder truck might be a good, better example than, uh, you know, as, as something to see how, how, the, how that was funded. Although that may be not a great example because it's a vehicle, but that's how we fund new vehicles. And you can go in and get the detail on it, and then you can see how it is, how it is funded ultimately. Yeah, you can get all the, get the background story on it. Things like that. So again, areas of concern that you're interested in, dig in deep and uh, and get it get staff the feedback, and we'll take it. But again, this was more of an open gov demonstration. Well, you'll get the uh, proposed uh, CFP budget, but you can look at it, what, what we're inputting to it right now as it's, as it's being built. But I think all the CFP projects have pretty good details in there. So on this uh, report here, the CFP by project, on the, the views tab, I've created some preset views where you can look individually at the uh, specific department or uh, in general category that we've um, established here for the CFP, the same categories we used in the previous years. So here you can see the wastewater CFP, uh, a huge chunk next year for the outfall project, uh, and then up and down throughout. Um, the, here are the individual line items for that and then the dollar amounts that go with them in the columns by year. Yeah, Steve had a good question here. So if you wanted to look at just the 2023 projects, uh, we, would, we can go just for wastewater or we can go back to all, and then we would click back on the filters. So we're in this saved view, and then when you click on the filters, these are the filters that are in that view, but you can add to them. So you could add a filter here and say you wanted um, the year. So that would be period year. And we would add 2023, and then we'll apply that. And so then that shows just the 2023 project. Uh, Mayor Mingle? Yes, Ms. Moulton. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stefan. Can you just kind of scroll over a little bit to the right so we see those different wastewater system cat or are those below the wastewater system categories that are colored in that table? What those are? Right here? Yeah. yeah. Is there a yeah. way we can show them like so we can see them? Is there like a yeah. column we can narrow so we can see what those are off the top of our view? Yeah, I mean, there's you know what no I mean? 
Unfortunately, there's no way for me to change the size of this uh, okay. little section, but I can, if you hover over them, you can see them. Oh, cool. Okay, well, that works. Yeah. Thanks. And I think you can do that on the bar graph as well. Is that correct? I can't remember. Like if you hover over the bar graph itself, no, to the left. To, to, yeah, yeah, there you go. That, that to me is an easier way to, to kind of, you can just go, oh, what's that, what's that big bar for? Well, that's our, uh, that's our outfall project. And then as you, as you look down to through 2028, you can see that, you know, why those changed. And I'm guessing the, 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 the green, the, the first green is maintenance stuff. Yep. And, and that, that's pretty stable over the next few years. And then, then you'll see the big jump in 2027, which is probably planning for the, uh, the new plant. You can also, right here, we can change the view yeah. of the chart. And sometimes the pie chart is easier to oh, see. Yeah, and then you yeah can that see one is kind of easier to see because it shows it. Mayor Miller. Mr. Walters. I appreciate all of the work that staff has put into this already, not just finance staff, but staff throughout all the other departments that have done all the data entry. I um, am still, I guess, optimistic this tool will provide us some better value in, in our ability to analyze these expenses, these forecasted expenses. I'm a little nervous about some of the limitations that we um, talked about in our finance committee meeting where we reviewed the software and um, I haven't logged in yet. <clears throat> So I haven't seen it myself and haven't been able to play with it yet. And I think that's the only way we'll really, we'll really know. Um, do I assume that um, Philip is giving out his cell phone number for technical assistance? I, I'd be happy to be uh, of help and uh, you may email me or call me, that's fine. Uh, I appreciate that. And, and again, the larger goal here, I, I think definitely being able to communicate where our expenses are <clears throat> and how we're spending money to the public is, is a high priority, but maybe a larger goal in the context of the capital facilities plan is being sure that we are planning for all the future capital expenses. And so um, that's only as good as the data that is input into the system. And I think probably more conversation needs to still be had about that and how it is we're making sure that we're accounting for all those expenses that otherwise might not appear on the books. Um, you know, the, the pavement we're not repairing uh, is also an expense. Um, and so we'll, we'll need to have conversations about how we're accounting for that. Any other uh, questions? I think that's a a good uh, overview, a uh, little toe into the water. Council, any other questions? Any are open gov superstars. Okay, uh, no other questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to continue providing feedback and dig around into it and anything that uh, jumps out that looks uh, doesn't look right, please let us know. With that, I will adjourn the city council meeting of 26 September, thanks. <laughs>